As we prepare ourselves to celebrate a Christmas that is nothing like the Christmas we had planned. It's tempting not to bother with certain things. But one thing that I'm pleased we've done is that we've peppered the house with nativity scenes. There's one that's like an advent calendar with a new figure being added every day. Another that was made by the roadside in Morogoro in Tanzania. Another made using corn in Kenya. And even a Playmobil one. What matters is that amongst the tinsel and trimmings of Christmas is a reminder of what it is all about. Firstly, there is the mother, Mary. Well, Mary was unlikely to have been any older than 13 and more likely to have been around 11 or 12 years old. She was humble, poor, and had probably not been in full-time education. In many ways, it seems remarkable that God should choose an unknown peasant girl living in an obscure part of the world to be the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. And yet that is precisely what happened. Mary, as you know, was visited by an angel who tells her that she is to have a child. But the whole thing, the whole thing rests on her willingness to obey. Mary, despite the stigma of having a child conceived out of wedlock and the dangers given that at the time nearly half of Jewish women died in childbirth, and despite the fact that Mary just before giving birth had to go on a long donkey ride to Bethlehem, despite these and other pressures, not least that of being able to support a child maybe on a carpenter's wage when there's a wedding to pay for as well, despite all this, Mary says, let it be done to me according to thy word. Paul Agudah says, here is a young girl who is asked by God to face disgrace in order to bring salvation into the world. She is charged with facing that disgrace and potential danger to life and limb alone. And she does it with courage and dignity. And Paula adds, the mother in me rails at God for asking too much of a young girl. But the Christian marvels at the courage of this young girl, Mary, whose sacrifice of her own reputation and safety enabled the word made flesh, God with us, to be born in our midst. And then there's the father, Joseph. Now, Joseph says absolutely nothing in any of our gospel accounts. Not a word of his is recorded. And yet Joseph does say one crucial thing. For it was the father's duty to name the child. And Joseph was told, you are to name him Jesus. Joseph does just this eight days after Jesus is born. Joseph names him Jesus, Yeshua, the God who saves. But apart from those early years, we hear nothing more from him. By the time Jesus embarks on his public ministry, Joseph is no longer on the scene. I guess he died sometime from when Jesus was 12 to when he was 30. Maybe it is only when we face the crude, almost offensive reality of Christmas that we can begin to see what it is that God was trying to say about himself. For 2,000 years, and certainly for the last 150 years or so, we've loaded onto Christmas a whole heap of excess baggage, the product of our fertile and over-romantic imagination, the inn, the stable, the wise men, the cattle, the shepherds, the star, the presents, the carols, and a warm glowing sensation inside, joy and peace and goodwill. The whole thing has maybe become a little sanitised and romanticised. The nativity scene we imagine may be more Disney than Bethlehem, more neat and tidy than dark and smelly. And this neat, tidy view of things gets projected onto God. How then can God understand the harsh realities of life? How can he empathise with those suffering today with coronavirus or with the homeless in our towns and cities or with the lonely and the grieving and the dying? How can God understand? If we judge God by our Christmas cards and tinsel, by the products of our romantic starry-eyed imagination, then we end up with a pleasant, ineffectual old duffer who is no God at all and no good at all. But actually, in his obscure, chaotic, impoverished birth, Jesus told us so much about God. He showed us that God is humble, approachable and courageous. God is humble. 
Before the time of Jesus, no pagan author ever used the word humble as a compliment. And yet Jesus shows us the humility of God, the maker of all things, immeasurable and mighty, great and awesome, became a single fertilised ovum which divided and redivided, developing into a fetus which grew inside a nervous teenager. John Donne described it as immensity, cloistered in thy dear womb. Philip Yancey wrote in his book about Jesus, the God who roared and could order armies and empires about like pawns on a chessboard. This God emerged in Palestine as a baby who could not speak or eat solid food or control his bladder, who depended on a teenage couple for shelter, food and love. Jesus shows us that God is humble, also that he's approachable. The Jewish people feared God. They offered sacrifices to him in their temple. They bowed down so low that their foreheads touched the ground. They believed that if you mishandled the Ark of the Covenant, then you would die. Jewish people would not even say or spell out the name of God. And yet it was amongst these people that God came to earth as a baby, a baby who cried and needed feeding and had to be changed, a baby who was held and cuddled and loved. The old ways of fearing God didn't work. God was too distant. He needed not to enforce the divide between us, but to span it. He needed a new relationship, a new covenant, a new testament. And the New Testament begins with the birth of a baby who was God. Humble, approachable, and yet courageous. G.K. Chesterton said that alone of all the creeds, Christianity has added courage to the virtues of the Creator. It took courage for God the Son to give up everything and to empty himself of all significance, to make himself nothing. Hands that flung stars into space, that moulded dry land and formed the contours of the universe, became tiny, barely able to grip, and someday they would yield to the cruel nails of a cross. As John says in his gospel, the world was made through him, yet the world knew him not. He came to his own home and his own people received him not. It would have been extremely courageous just to have risked rejection, but God came to earth knowing that he would be despised and dismissed, knowing that he would be misunderstood and knowing that his birth would also be the beginning of his death. But Jesus was not the only one to show courage. Think of God the Father, trusting the salvation of the world to the willingness of a teenage girl to cooperate with him. Think of him as he watched on while his own son lay in that manger, while Herod plotted his death and as others finally succeeded in killing him. Think of God the Father watching on as his son called out, Why, Father? Why have you forgotten me? to suffer and to witness that suffering were acts of God's sheer courage. And God is courageous still. Even now he takes the risks that we will reject him, that we will turn our back on him, that we will forget him. This humble, approachable, courageous God couldn't be closer to you than he is right now. And he knows, he understands. You don't have to explain to him, he's there sharing your frustrations feeling your sadness and understanding your fears. If you're grieving, he knows what it is to grieve. If you're lonely, he understands. If you're suffering, he's been there too. God is humble, approachable. Emmanuel, God is with us. And God is courageous still. He chooses to depend on you. It's through you that he will often show love, help people and answer prayer. It's through you that he will bring peace and establish justice, and it's through you that he now chooses to make himself known. This isn't going to be the Christmas that I planned or longed for, but in those quieter moments, and there may be quite a few of those, I can perhaps take time to marvel at the miracle of it all, of Mary and Joseph, and of a God who is humble, approachable and courageous. Amen.